Hi, I'm Jo Fry. I'm with the Half Moon Bay History Association, and this is the August History Presentation on Miramar. We're at the beautiful Odd Fellows Hall. Been living here on the coast for over 20 years, raised two kids, a 18-year-old just started CSM in summer, so yay. Uh, it's a great place, and so as, as children got older, I began doing beach combing. I'm a sea glass artist. I um, have works in ocean blue. Um, own for, uh, Fierce Siren Studios, that's me, I'm the Fierce Siren. And you may see me at Harvard Market or Make It Main Street, I do that kind of thing. But beachcombing has become a passion. I'm quite the sea glass uh, person. Over, well, about 58,000 pieces now since I've been logging them. And I've got them all cataloged by beach and tide and, and all of those things. Uh, but I'm not only interested in the pretty glass, I'm interested in the history and so Finding the things that we find on the beach has spurred me to, um, to investigate the history, and that's what I want to share, because Miramar is, an, is a nice place. We want to go to the restaurants. We want to see the art galleries. And did you know it had such a bad reputation at one point in time that the Ocean Shore Railroad changed the name of the town to Miramar, because they didn't want to be associated with the bad reputation. So here we go. It's a photo that I took of, of the pier. So what you see, uh, see is you can see the remnants of the pier. And when I took some of my photos, there were still two pier um, pieces, wood pieces jutting out. The storms last winter um, have taken one of them out. And it's only a matter of time before this is gone. And this was built in 1869, the bones of it were, um, by Ozia Ames. And hence, Miramar used to be called Amesport. But every story needs a beginning, so I'm gonna go way back. And this is uh, based on a Saturday I spent poring over USGS reports because we find a lot of rocks. And these are rocks commonly found. Hey, there's quartz, feldspar, jaspers, uh, the occasional onyx, the occasional crystal. Why do we find all these rocks? It's because, because our, our under, under, under layer, layer out in the bay is volcanic. Um, it was formed in the Los Angeles area 70 to 90 million years ago and dragged up here by the San Andreas Fault. So when you're walking on the beach and you find a white rock piece of quartz, that's where it came from. It came from volcanic activity down in the Los Angeles area. Sitting on top of that is a formation known as the Parissima Formation. This goes down to about Monterey, um, in Santa Cruz, they've found well skeletons in this layer. This layer is three to five million years old, and that's where our fossils come from. So there's coral fossils, whalebone, you can find bones. This is a, we think a piece of whalebone, although I'm not an expert in that. Um, definitely coral, and all kinds of shells. There's bones, and, and you're available to come up and see these later, but this is because of the Parisma formation. So that's where this thing really started. We know human habitation has happened from the last few thousand years. We don't know exactly how long. The other reason I wanted to do this is during COVID, we had a meeting at the History Association. It was in someone's house. And one of the people said that their relative, a relative had said to them that this area doesn't have any history. And you know that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. So it's another reason to do this. So our local tribe was called the Chiguan. We know there were two different villages, one in the Princeton Harbor area, and then one down by Pillar Cedos. So between those two areas lies Miramar. And we know that fishing was done there and a lot of human habitation. These tribes wouldn't have been incredibly large, but I think they're incredibly important because it wasn't just that this land was, was uninhabited, it was quite inhabited. In fact, when the Spanish first arrived, they commented on how barren the hills were. And the hills were barren because they were maintained, they were controlled burned. They they wanted to stimulate the growth of the grasses that they used for their food, or for their medicine. So this was all very sophisticated communities. And from that area, we know that um, they traded shells. The shells they traded were olive shells. We find all 
with shells on the beach today, in, in vast numbers, it's probably the number one shell that we find. And these were money. Shells were money before gold, before coins, before everything else. Shells were used as currency. All of shells have been found as far away as Arizona. And there was a young woman who did a dissertation on this, and I looked at her paper and was basically studying the age of the shells and finding out that these were traded for thousands of years. So our local tribes would have had money. They would have been pretty well off in terms of their the, the, the ability to barter with other tribes. Um, there was a great need of food source. So this is an area of a great deal of wealth. One of the most prized artifacts that we have dates from this period, and it is a point. It's not an arrowhead. It's a point. They did not use arrows, and I know this from presentations by Mark. If you've ever heard Mark speak and ever get the opportunity, he is a fascinating, fascinated speaker. He um, did a, a talk on native pathways, and I showed him pictures of this point that we found. This is made of red shirt. Red shirt isn't something that we find on the beach. Shirt is an organic com uh, compound. We do find shirt, but not this color. So this was a traded for material. And this has definitely worked, and it's definitely been tumbled, but you can see in all of this, it was sitting on a rock, and it looks different than anything else around. So this was worked by human hands and worked by our local tribe. So that is where uh, I think <laughs> the start of a lot of this history comes from. They said we have other kinds of chert. Chert is an organic material, so this would have been laid down by um, plankton, and it gets compressed, and over time forms these layers. This is another type of chert that I know they, they traded for, but I actually find this out on our, uh, on our beaches too. This is called Monterey chert, and it has this beautiful zebra, kind of a black, white, gray pattern, and this was another prize material that I know that they made points out of. So the Spanish were here and came by Half Moon Bay in 1585. I mean, if you come to think, 1585, what was going on? Queen Elizabeth I was reigning in England. I mean, that was a long time ago. It was before the Spanish Armada fought the English. It was a long time ago. So what did they do? They kind of just went by and didn't really stop. They didn't establish anything. And it, being made, it kept that way for about 200 years. Um, the reason why they came back 200 years later is other people were discovering California. We know that Russia had come down and was doing trading with, with native tribes and that they were actively uh, hunting. And so I think they were feeling the pressure from, from Russia and also from England. We know that there were also English explorers out here. So they wanted to maintain a base. And the mission system was then established with San Francisco and um, Mission Dolores in 1776. So they came through in our area in 1769. So that would have been really first encounter with native tribes. And where they first sighted the San Francisco Bay is on Sweeney Ridge. So you can see that up there. You can hike up to this area from um, areas up on the peninsula, but is where they came over from our side, from the, the ocean side, and first sighted the San Francisco Bay. And they had been looking for the San Francisco Bay. I know that there's been other papers that have been posted on, on I think, our people have written about it and Huffington Bay History Association, but they were looking for it and came all the way up from from the San Diego area and uh, Monterey, thinking that that was it, and it's not really quite it, but here it was. They finally found it and established um, Mission Dolores and the Presidio. Really, the Presidio was the military base. Don't have a lot of artifacts that I can date from the Spanish period. Uh, they weren't really around Half Moon Bay. They were primarily up in San Francisco. But what we know is they did graze uh, their vast herds of cattle down here. And I had heard that um, the Arroyo and El Medio, we all know this. This is an older picture taken before they, they did the, uh, the refurbishment in the last year or so. Uh, but this Arroyo was, was actually a key place. 
I had read that they had herded cattle in there for, for slaughter. No documentation about that, but that would have been an important point. We know that they were down here. They know, we know that they had cattle. We know that um, native tribesmen were, were probably helping them maintain their, their cattle herds. They had the adobe in Pacifica. So definitely is starting to establish some sort of a presence down here. So the um, mission system began to crumble after only about 50 years. And um, that time period is really interesting. So the people living here maybe wouldn't have considered themselves necessarily Spanish. They wouldn't have considered themselves necessarily Mexican, but Californios. And so this is a really interesting time in our history. It's before the gold rush. And so there was a very sparse population in the whole state of California. Uh, Mexico. Uh, fought and they won the independence from Spain in 1821. So Mexico held California for a relatively brief period of time, only about a couple of decades. And during that time, where you see the, uh, the high honchos up in San Francisco can see that the system is crumbling and they start paring off land and doing land grants. So the Arroyo and Del Medio, uh, that Arroyo was um, named that because it was in the middle between two Mexican land grants. And you can see Guerrero had north and Vasquez, Tiburcio Vasquez, held the area south of that, of that creek and, and held the area that is now Half Moon Bay. And he came down and established the first settlement here known as San Benito. So the interesting thing I, th I took <laughs> is that um, there was a famous outlaw named Tiburcio Vasquez. That was not him. That was his nephew. And that he was actually, you know, they tracked down and I think eventually killed the, the famous outlaw. But that he was involved, the, the person who got the land grant was involved in a land dispute and was actually shot dead, murdered, in a saloon. So shot in the back of the head while sitting in a saloon. So kind of sa unsavory little history there. It was another person he was partnered with that was also um, killed over that same land dispute, and that happened in San Francisco. So California, gold, gold's discovered. Um, creating the, the largest influx of, of people, migration of people. We know that people came to this area from all over the world and making their mark or trying to make their mark, trying to, uh, to gain their fortune in San Francisco. Some did, but the majority of them, of course, didn't. Um, people would then try to, to do what they did prior to, to getting gold fever. A lot of them were farmers. We know farmers came into our area and some of them were opportunists. So Josiah P. Ames, he was an Englishman by birth. Um, he saw how we were getting our crops. So at that time, we were farming, a lot of fishing, a lot of farming. We grew potatoes, we grew grains for horses. We had valuable crops that the burgeoning city of San Francisco was hungry for. And those crops were taken up sort of laboriously by, by wagons hauled over maybe this old San Pedro Road. There was a road we know that, that came out of where El Granada is now and ended up on the peninsula, and also Highway 92. Highway 92 had been a footpath, and then it had been a stagecoach road. So that's how crops were moved out. Um, very labor intensive. So what he did is he got some financers and he decided to, to build a pier. There were other wharfs in the Princeton area, but his pier was going to be available, accessible. Those other wharfs were kind of crumbling and they built a pier. And the pier they built was, was pretty grand. This is what we see, the, the bones coming out of the cliff. That, that's his pier, that's Amesport's, Ames's pier. And this is a, I love this picture. I mean, it's, it's a pretty old picture, and it's showing what really was going on. This pier was 1,000 feet long. So you can think, I stand there sometimes, and I'm thinking what is like, would be 1,000 feet out inside of, of the ocean, jutting out into the ocean. It's, it's kind of dramatic to think about. We know the waves can come in there pretty, pretty hard, we know that because they've got all the riprap. And so this pier was extended out and built in 1869, 1,000 feet out. Adjacent to the pier on the land above was a warehouse and 
It's not quite as big as a football field, but pretty in impressive at 300 feet by 100 feet. There were rails down the, down the center of the warehouse. There were rails on the pier. And if you can see that horse is pulling the wagon, there's a guy. There were rails on that pier going all the way out that they could pull down. And it's actually, I think they used mules instead of horses. But imagine this, a thousand sacks of grain per hour could be loaded. Steamships would line up sometimes as many as three deep in Miramar. Three, three steamships coming from all parts of the world. And we know they're all parts of the world because of some of the things that we find. I find a lot of ginger beer bottles. <laughs> Shards. <laughs> Um, this one is interesting. This is a company in Glasgow. And I know by the stamped maker's mark, this was found in Miramar, in, embedded in the riprap there. So a wave cut it in, it got caught under the rocks, and I found it. And it's H. Kennedy. And I know that this dates um, earlier than 1891, because in 1891, he added and sons to his name. So it was H. Kennedy. So this is dating to the time of the pier. There was a saloon there. Of course there was a saloon. <laughs> because you had a lot of fur thirsty sailors. You had a lot of abalone divers. You had a lot of unsavory kind of characters that would be coming in and out of the town. Again, this is, this, this is Miramar. Doesn't that seem kind of weird that all this was happening? But we know they had a saloon there. The person who ran the pier was named Mullins. And I will show a picture of his house. This was taken in the 1970s. I'm not quite sure if that's still there, but, but that was his house. And um, the arroyo was sometimes called by locals Mullins Creek. I think he ran it with a bit of an iron fist, if I could, you know, a little bit of power makes uh, everyone go to their head and makes them a little bit of, I don't know. I know there was a, a dispute one time and supposedly it resulted in some guns being drawn and apparently this house had some fence with some bullet holes in it because of the dispute. Um, so all that was going on there too. Um, the heyday would have been, the glory days were the 1870s. In the 1870s, we were growing a lot of potatoes. You don't think of potatoes in Half Moon Bay. Artichokes, of course, but not potatoes. Um, potatoes were a number one crop, and they maintained that way until there was a blight. Apparently, there was a, a worm that blighted the potatoes and blighted the futures. And all of that, um, plus other factors, kind of contributed to the pier going into a little bit of decline. But during the heyday, uh, farmers as far away as San Gregorio would would drive up just to drop their stuff off at the pier and have it be picked up by steamship. So very busy, very, very hopping place. Um, I'm gonna go back to that saloon. A couple years ago, there was a big storm and part of the cliff eroded away and we started finding these fragments of bottles and these are um, seltzer bottles and mineral water bottles, but they're from all over the Bay Area. This one's from San Jose, um, there's San Mateo, there's um, Napa Valley, the Napa Valley Jacksons, and this is found, we have a bottle in the, in the museum, so this is a very common bottle, and this place is interesting. This was up in Napa Valley. At the heyday, there was such a demand for mineral water, and why do you think they needed mineral water? I would think to cut through the gut rock whiskey that was around, maybe? Um, there was such a demand for this, that they were running 24-hour shifts in the 1880s just to feed the demand of San Francisco and, and all of us people. So that's kind of interesting. And so I find these bottles. Um, the museum has one. Um, this one was actually in a state sale, but I have found them in the cliff as well. I brought this because I think it's kind of cool. It shows the, the stopper that would have been in it. Um, definitely 1800s, but this type of lip, probably 1870s, 1880s, fits right in with that time period. I know this was found locally. It came from a local estate. Um, they had all different kind of maker's marks. So uh, Pacific Glass Works, located in San Francisco, made some of these, but they were probably made by a lot of different bottle makers, because if you're moving that much product, you need a lot of bottles to put it in. <coughs> This is one of my favorite ones. Because who doesn't love a cute little bottle? Mm -hmm. um, this came out of the cliff as well, and from the same place where all these broken bits, those, those bits were thrown into 
the pit. Um, and sometimes I find them at what I call privy level. So they were thrown in broken. They didn't get broken by the waves, or they didn't get broken falling out. They, they were put in broken. So what I probably think happened is they're just throwing their bottles out and they're breaking and then there's a big pile of glass and so somebody just dug a hole and stuck it in. That's probably what I think. And though that where that hole is has been eroded out. Some of it goes into the ocean to form sea glass. This fell out, um, literally was falling out during the storm. <laughs> we were out there at night. This one is a favorite because it comes from Watertown, Connecticut, and it's Thompson's Eye Wash. Okay, what's eye wash? Opium. <laughs> Opium does an eye good, right? So, so that's why this one is my favorite. Um, there was a whole lot of quack cures back then, and I think um, one of our new acquisitions, we got a donated bottle, um, also was another quack cure, so I think that's worth a story telling. We've got a a bottle that's Piso's cure for consumption in the museum, and you know we did we, consumption was tuberculosis. You don't just cure it with Wacom. <laughs> so by the 1880s, and the potatoes are kind of going away, and maybe things are slowing up a little bit. Um, that the end of the heyday has it was coming. And um, Ames sold the rights to his beer to the Pacific Mail, the steamship company. Their headquarters were in San Francisco, and they ran that pier until, or they ran the warehouse pier until it was sold in 1916. So business, there was complaints about it, that it was slow, that it was ineffective. And um, long comes the late 1800s, and San Francisco has a group that want to build a railroad. And they want to build a railroad connecting San Francisco to Santa Cruz. That will move all the produce much more quickly than even a steamship, much more efficiently. So the business at the pier began to decline. It was still owned. Um, it's interesting, there were other businesses moving into that warehouse at this time. Um, I had read that there was a ice skating rink put into that warehouse. So imagine in Miramar, there was an ice skating rink. Pretty interesting. We know that uh, Half Moon Bay had their own mineral water company, the Half Moon Bay Mineral Water Company, that was held in that pier. That's where they were based, and that's where they did their business. And we find bottles as well with that stamp on it. One of them has it at the bottom, and one of them has it at the side. So if you can see that says it's stamped with the little moon and half moon bay. And so it all is that same area where the pier was, where the warehouse was, where this business was operating. And again, judging by this type of bottle, we're still pre-machine made. We're still in the 1800s when this was made. And it all fits in with the history of what was going on. So the Ocean Shore Railroad had this vision of creating um, a destination point on our coast for a lot of wealthy San Franciscans. And these, these people would be taking the train down during the day and seeing our beautiful coastline and hopefully buying land that the railroad would get a, get a cut. So they, they established the town of Granada. They had a lot of other towns that they were going to establish. Not all of them came to fruition. There's no town called Farallon, but there was a plan for one. And you see the map as it, come down, it comes down the coast and, and it came around Pacifica, around that, that difficult area there. And if you're ever in Pacifica and you go to the, uh, come out of the tunnel and you know that, that big beautiful bay there that they have, look over to, to the side of it, and you can see this flat spot, that's where the railroad ran. It ran all the way around it. It's an interesting spot to walk. When they pulled up the tracks, all that got pulled off, but that's where the railroad ran as it came all the way down through Pacifica and, and down to our coastline. So it cost a lot of money to build a railroad around Devil's Slide. And in 1906, something happened that really hurt the finances of the, the railroad, and that was the earthquake. And the railroad never made it all the way down to Santa Cruz. They started building Santa Cruz and up, 
And you can see pieces of that in, in Davenport. And they built San Francisco and down and made it as far as Tunitas Creek. So from Tunitas Creek, there was actually um, a, a vehicle, first a wagon and then um, a motor vehicle that would take the, the, the travelers down and to meet up with the, the, the railroad that was coming up from Santa Cruz. So it never did what it was envisioned to do, um, which is unfortunate. And again, like the Mexican area, this, this era of the railroad, which I find is, is one of a favorite because it's such a romantic era, it only lasted for two decades because then something else came along that was even more efficient, and that was the automobile. That's the uh, shard of the ginger beer bottle on the pier. Thought that was, that was the day I found it. <laughs> I love this picture. Isn't that, I mean, th look at this picture, and look at the, the inset picture is the pier. So that's the thousand foot long pier. At the railroad picture, if you can see kind of in the background, you can see the pier as well. So we now know that there's, there's houses built there, but you can faintly see the, the Ainsport Pier. So, didn't have a good reputation. You're building this destination. You want wealthy San Francisco tourists to come down. You want them to fall in love with El Granada. Uh, streets were laid out, they had a prominent architect doing this, they planted trees, some of those trees which toppled over at the storm, we know that, some of those big trees, they planted eucalyptus, they planted the, the cypress, those big old trees were, were from the railroad, and a lot of the, the uh, sidewalks and the curbs, those were originally built by the railroad too. And you, you got this. That doesn't mesh with the beautiful vision, so they changed the name to Miramar. They changed the name so it wouldn't have that association with the, the unsavory characters that would frequent it. So, after, so the, there was a land boom with, with the railroad, and as the railroad began to decline, their business began to decline, they tried to do a lot to keep that business, but the motor car came through and it hastened the demise of the railroad. And by, by, by 1920, 1922, all the tracks were unfortunately torn up. But um, there, there are stories. So the next, the next person that enters into this is um, uh, the Potato King. His name is Miguel. The Miguel name is still here in our town. In fact, um, someone I work with, her husband is, is Miguel. He was related to the person that, that bought that warehouse and that bought that pier. And when I told him about this, he said, well, I thought we had a hotel in the family back in the day. So it was really kind of interesting. He bought that land. So as the railroad business began to, to decline with the automobile, the prices of land began to go down too. So, he was a farmer. He farmed potatoes, he farmed artichokes, and he also had taken his produce to that pier when he was younger, and he told a story that I find pretty interesting. So the pier goes up for sale, Joseph Miguel buys it, and he has a story that he told his son, and his son told this to, to a lady named June Morrell, and I really stand on the back of, of what she wrote. Um, you can find a lot of her things in uh, still online. She had a blog, she was a history writer, and she was able to interview people that are no longer with us. So this is why it's so important that we do these interviews and this, we're gonna lose a lot of memory and a lot of our history. But he told her a story about being on that pier and having the center of it collapse and the wagon with all the produce and the horse and him all tumbled into the ocean. He survived, the rest of it did not. And one day, um, it was very interesting, a horseshoe and horse teeth found almost together on the beach in Miramar. I, was it, was it, I can't say that it was the horse that came and tumbled into the ocean, but it's really kind of coincidental that it's there, and I'd like to think that maybe there's a link there. We don't know, but maybe. <coughs> Joseph wanted to build a hotel, and he had a pretty grand vision of what he wanted to do. The warehouse was torn down. 
and reuse, repurpose, and he built his hotel, and it was huge, and it was beautiful. It had a heated indoor swimming pool filled with salt water. And I can tell you, after storms, and this has happened once, where it's ripped down to bedrock, you can see pipes still sitting there. And I could think maybe those were part of that swimming pool, but, but what a grand vision for a, a hotel. The largest hotel on the coast. It oh, had this beach in front, this wide beach, and it, it was beautiful. Where would that be at now? Do you know where there's condos now? There, there's condos built? That's where it was at. Yeah, and it, that building stood into the late 1960s, and we have somebody uh, who, who actually used to to work there and frequent there, and uh, it stood until, and I'll get to this, um, it mysteriously burned down. Um, this, I love this picture, and it shows, um, still some construction appears to be going on. The, the lady and the woman look like they're in 1920s clothing, which kind of fits in, um, and you can see the scars prominently from the rails that used to exist on that pier. The pier had been, in, been you know, around since 1869. It was getting a little uh, worse for the wear, so in, in conjunction with building the hotel, he did put effort into shoring up that pier because he wanted this to be a destination. People could go fishing, they could, they could be on the beach, they could um, eat his wonderful food, and it was known, his restaurant was known for Kraft Chipino and, and all the delicious food that, that he served there. But this, pier is, uh, this picture is really cool because the gate um, that's in front that had that, you know, no trespassing and information spelled wrong, information, um, that's still there. So this is telling me we're, we're about at the time it's, it's either just opened or not long after it's opened. So, interestingly enough, there's a crane in this picture. Or Was crane. that the same as in Albert's Miramar Hotel? Yes, yes, it is exactly the same. So Albert bought it after World War II. So Miguel, uh, Joseph Miguel held it until then. So see what that crane is? It's really interesting. The, the time that that was stripped down to bedrock, we found this pulley at the exact same spot, the exact same spot that's in that picture. And we've been able to get it to turn once again, because it's frozen. And it, I mean, I'd like to say that that's in the picture there. I don't know, but it could be. And so it was the exact same spot. And the little picture shows, there's the pipes that I told you about. And if you go there now, you can rest your arm on where the one remaining beam is. But they're about 12 feet over my head. It, I mean, well, about 12 feet above where I'm standing when I took this picture. And I really have only seen this happen the one time where it was so stripped down. It's really sort of interesting. So you can see some later pictures of this beautiful hotel. So now there's some safety rails, it appears. The, um, the, yeah, the young gentleman sitting there, um, because the earlier picture, there were no safety rails. If you're walking out a thousand feet and there's small children, I hope there's something <laughs> there in place so that they don't just fall in. Um, it was known as a destination for motorcyclists as well. In the 1920s, um, motor people would bring their motorcycles over and race up and down this wide expanse of beach. We don't really have that wide expanse of beach anymore, and, and there is a reason. The jetty changed things a lot that was built out in Princeton Harbor. But I think this is very interesting. So could you imagine this spot in the 1920s during Prohibition? Like, what a fun place to be. <laughs> you think there's alcohol? We know there's alcohol there. Can't prove it, but, but we know. <laughs> So is this the beach headed towards Surfer Beach? Mm -hmm. It's looking south. Yeah, we're looking south. So where we're standing is um, going towards Surfer's Beach and probably in front of where the Miramar is. And we're looking south to see that pier. And it's, it's really dwarfing the, the people that are standing underneath it, you know, watching these motorcyclists race up and down, which we wouldn't have today. Again, it's really horrible for the beach. But there you go. Um, but that's where we are. And so 
we don't have this wide expanse of beach anymore. I mean, at extreme low tides, you can see that beach out there, but it doesn't quite look like this. And it's, it's the jetty that did it, the building of the jetty. We find a lot of these things. Actually, when we find them, we call them, we, it's like we have a name, boop -dee. Um, These are barrel hoops. They're all about the same size, very uniform. They're made out of iron, and I've got a lot of them. And so could this be from steamships, from, from shipwrecks, from prohibition, you know, people dumping their illegal alcohol? I can't, I don't really know enough about it, but they're all very uniform. If I take all of them and line them up, it is quite clear what these are. These were, these were, came from, from barrels or they're strapping or, or something. Um, but I'd like to think maybe uh, some prohibition came around and the pro highs came out and uh, they had to dump the alcohol. Who knows? So Miramar, the Miramar Inn is, is still there and uh, there was a very colorful character named Amy Crowley who ran that. Uh, it was definitely a place where you could go if you, if you were thirsty and you wanted to find alcohol and it was illegal, I think you could, you could go there. There were also um, ladies of maybe a, a questionable nature that, that kind of lived there, I stayed there, and upstairs was a bordello, I think we would call it. Um, there were places, um, her partner was a, it was a carpenter, and so we know that there were places built where alcohol could be conveniently stored away and it wouldn't look like it was a cabinet, but it could be put behind the cabinet, and we know that she was visited by, by agents, and they were called pro highs, prohibition agents. Um, so that was going on. Um, there were stories. I talked to a gentleman who had been in high school here in, in Huffington Bay High School in the 1960s, and he had a story about some friends finding alcohol or finding or seeing bottles built, and I, I, bottles in, in the Arroyo. So apparently they would bring them in and hide them in there, in the, in the Arroyo, where that all comes out. I don't know. They're, I mean, can't vouch for that story at second hand, but I think that's kind of fun. And I think one of the people at a, at a meeting, history meeting, said like, yeah, in the 80s they were, they were going around looking to see if there were any, like, any bottles still buried there. Who knows? Don't have any bottles, but I have one from 1934 when it was legal. Prohibition was repealed. machine made and dated, so there's conveniently date codes on some of the manufacturers, and so this is a uh, liquor bottle from 1934, the year after Prohibition ended, so quite legal to have and uh, found around the area too. So the war came, and the war came to the coast, and we know that there were certain um, people that were half in Bay natives that were not allowed to, to cross Main Street to the west. And we know that there was a military presence. We know that Camerons, there, were, there was military down there. There were still bunkers down by Smithfield. And there was a fort in Miramar in 1943. It existed for one year, and it was called Fort Miramar. It extended from the hotel, so the military took over the hotel. They put a lot of temporary wo uh, wooden buildings up, and also they took over a school that would have been out by, I think around where the barn may be right now, that this, this school was out there. Highway 1 didn't exist, so it was, it was further away from, from the shore, but then there was an elementary school, and they took over that whole land and became Fort Miramar. And from this area, era it is really interesting. We found a military button in, in 2018, and we had thought that, oh, maybe somebody was wearing a vintage coat, and they just dropped their button. But it is an Army officer's button, and it was an Army base. So I think this really ties in with the presence there during the war. I've got all these up here if you want to see them, too. Um, also. Coming out of the cliff is this wine bottle, and this is date stamped again by the, the bottle by the manufacturer of the bottle. This was manufactured on the East Coast, which is really unusual. Um, most of the bottles I find are um, they have plant codes that are.
plant 20 or plant 23. 20 was Oakland and 23 was Los Angeles. And almost all the bottles that I can date um, from Owens, Illinois, large, large glass manufacturer still in existence, um, they all come from California. This one does not. I think it's Pennsylvania. There's, I can't remember exactly, but it's an East Coast and it's, it's 1943 date code and it was found at the location of, of Camp Miramar. So I think that's all very, very telling because there weren't, wouldn't have been a lot of civilians just wandering through where, where the military base was. It just wouldn't have happened. So I do think that this, this kind of ties in and dates to, that, to the base that was there. Fort Miramar was deemed um, redundant because there was also a large uh, military base up in Montero where the White House is now, and there's secret base up there. There's a lot of great information in the in the jail and the history museum about that. Um, but uh, so so they didn't feel the need for having both of those, and so 1943 was the only year that this existed in Miramar. After the war. Um, the Miguel sold the hotel, and they sold it to a family, um, Albert, his wife, Eva, who were restaurateurs over in the peninsula, and they bought it. So, so this hotel had a beautiful bar, and this bar came from the Spreckles Mansion, and you can see a picture of it. I mean, it it's really would have been a stunning looking bar. They restored it um, for a while in the 1950s, so a lot of, a lot of you know, wonderful things happened in the 1950s, the economy's good, the war is over, there was quite the boom, and so this got restored kind of back to its heyday. Um, I think the uh, the pool was no longer in existence, and that got covered over and was a dance floor, and lights were projected out onto the ocean, like blue and gold, different colored lights projected out into the ocean, so I can see this as being this really sort of hopping place again. This is a fun artifact that I found. And really, this um, doesn't date to the post-war. I think this is earlier. I think this dates to the 1920s. It's a bottle of Paris perfume. Mm -hmm. And um, it was by Cody, and it came out in the 1920s. And if you take the cap off of this, you can still get a hint of the perfume. And I think this is about 100 years old. And so I find that is really amazing, kind of fun. So time, time passes, the jetty gets built in 1959, 1960, and what it does is it really changes the currents of the, the water coming into Half Moon Bay, and you begin to get this erosion happening. These photos were taken in the 1970s, so there was a road that came from, from Half Moon Bay and down into Princeton Harbor, and it ran in front of where the Miramar is. There was a wide stretch of beach in front of the Miramar, and this was eroded at, I think they said it's like 12 feet a year at its, its mm -hmm. height. There were cars and, and other garbage dumped down there um, to try to stop the erosion. And finally, the riprap, which is still there, we see that riprap, was put in because it took the road and, and ate it out and, and ate a lot, of, a lot of housing and structures that may have still been there. I remember speaking with one gentleman who had grown up there, and he's like, the house that he lived in as, as a small child is no longer there. It's just been eroded out. And it, and it changed things. I mean, things always do change, but it just changed the way the coasts look. I did a little blurb about walk dancing in Dyna Dynamite Society, and there's a really good um, article on the website about that, a little more detail. So, so there was still a lot of things that happening and thriving, and, and always, people always come to the beach. People come to the beach every weekend, so coming to enjoy it, and they don't see the erosion, and they don't see the changes, they just have a great day at the beach. So the hotel um, ended up burning down in 1967, and um, I can't say that it was arson, but somebody told me um, that her husband had been a firefighter that answered that call, and very mysteriously, all the alcohol was taken out of the bar. So, hmm, um, maybe it was sort of falling apart, and I know that um, the back part of it has this erosion happened, parts of it were falling into the sea, 
um, there is a story that that the cooks in the kitchen sometimes instead of just uh, washing the dishes would throw them out, you know, it's easier. And um, I find a lot of dish fragments, like restaurant dish fragments, very ocean tumbled, and a lot of cutlery. <laughs> kind of supports this. This is my favorite piece. It is a twisted, like twisted monstrosity, it looks like Medusa's hair um, of a fork, and this was found smack dab in, in Miramar where the hotel used to be. So maybe that story is true. Maybe they were throwing out the dirty dishes instead of washing them. Um, what you see there is the sign that was torn down. That was the sign for the Paris of uh, the Palace Miramar. Uh, that was torn down in the 1970s, and that was before Medio Road in Miramar. It resided. There's still some some open land and a lot of uh, houses around there, and that's where that sign had stood. And so that got torn down as well. And so there's really um, not not much left. What we what we know is beyond the history. There there's condominiums there now. I can tell you, every, every time I walk that path back behind, I'll, I'll find something. I'll find an oyster shell or a glass fragment. Some of them datable, and some of them I can date definitely to the era of the hotel. So if they've got any time of a date code, I can say, oh, that's the 1930s, the 1920s. Um, so there's still bits and pieces around if you look hard enough. Sources. But wait, there's more. So um, the hotel was supposed to have been haunted. I can't speak to that. But since as we're heading into fall, it's kind of fun to mention that there were some rooms where lights and chandeliers moving and all of that. And does it sound familiar like the Moss Beach Distillery? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but I just think that that was very fun. And, and Jim Morrell did a story about that. So I, I can't let it go without you know mentioning the possible ghost and, Boy, is he still hanging around? Where did he come from? I don't know. <laughs> so that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for letting me do this and, and geek out in front of you all and, and share some of these things that I found and share this history of this area that just you know, next time you walk, you walk the beach, you're going to think about it a little bit differently and all the characters who perhaps walked there before you. We're at the beautiful Odd Fellows Hall, and I'm really happy to showcase the artifacts that were part of that presentation. First, our base layer is volcanic, and from that layer we find quartz, feldspar, jasper, and other volcanic stones, even rarities such as onyx and amethyst crystals. Beach agates and chalcedony nodules would have formed in the crevices of those volcanic um, rock, and we find sometimes crystals. If we're very lucky, these beautiful agates. Sitting on top of that layer, these are fossils. This is part of the per Parissima formation that is three to five million years old, and we find fossilized coral, shells, and even whale bone. There were native people here. Um, the dispute is how long, but there were tribes. Their tribe was the Chiguan, two villages. They would have um, found these shells. These shells have been found as far away as Arizona. They are olive shells or olivella, olivella uh, still commonly found on the beach and were traded for bartered as beads. This is one of our prized possessions. This is a Chiguan point. It is made of red shirt, which is not native to our beaches. Um, it is, according to district archaeologists, three and a half to 7,000 years old. From possibly the Spanish or Mexican era, we find terracotta dishware, such as this part of a cup, and you can even see the fingerprints of the artisan that made it. In 1869, a pier was built that serviced steamships from all over the globe coming into San Francisco. And we find artifacts such as these ginger beer bottles. This one with this maker's mark was from Glasgow, Scotland. It's older than uh, 1891. Also from the pier era, we know there was a saloon and we find a lot of various types of mineral waters from all over the Bay Area. 
Um, these bottle fragments all date from the 1880s and 1890s, Japson's Napa Valley soda water. Some bottles would have come in from um, not only Europe, but from the east coast of the United States. This is a small bottle found in that, that same saloon area, Thompson's Eye Wash. It uh, actually contained opium. This bottle probably is from the 1880s. Later on, as the pier was uh, declining, other businesses were moving in, um, such as the Half Moon Bay Mineral and Soda Water Company. And these bottles were found in a location where this product was, was actually made pre-1900. We know there was a collapse of the pier and that horses were thrown into the ocean and perished. Interestingly enough, we find horse tack. This is a piece of a horseshoe and also horse teeth. And these were all found in the same day. So probably from a carcass of a horse. Um, this winch and pulley probably date from the um, disconstruction of the Palace Miramar Hotel. There's actually photographic evidence that shows a, uh, a kind of a crane, and this was found right where the location of that crane was in the photo. In the 1920s, the hotel would have been a very popular destination for tourists on motorcycles or on uh, uh, coming in via the brand new uh, automobiles and this perfume bottle was found. This is a Paris perfume by Cody and this bottle probably dates from the 1920s. You can still scent, smell a scent, a whiff of that perfume when you open it. Prohibition. Uh, we know that uh, illegal alcohol was, was brought in and interestingly enough there's a lot of these barrel hoops. They could have been from Prohibition times. They could have been from the steamship era. We don't know but they're always, they're all very uniform in their size and um, correspond exactly to barrel hoops. Prohibition was repealed in 1933, and this whiskey bottle dates from 1934, interestingly enough. So as soon as it's repealed, um, alcohol is, is back legally in all of our restaurants in Miramar. During World War II, there was a army base called Fort Miramar, and we find artifacts such as this wine bottle that's date stamped 1943. This bottle was produced in the, in the East Coast and found its way here in the exact location where that fort was. We also have an army officer's button, and this is a World War II button found in that same location. In the 1960s, um, there were tales of the restaurant throwing dirty dishes out the window and thrown to the ocean of the then crumbling Palace Miramar. I find a lot of cutlery and a lot of uh, broken dishware that's been ocean tumbled, and this is my favorite fork. Thank you.